Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology, and in this video, I'm going to talk about myasthenia gravis. This condition is fairly rare and causes muscular weakness and fatigue, particularly when performing repetitive actions. When we want to make a movement, the brain signals the muscles to contract. The electrical signals generated by the brain and transmitted down the nerves are converted to the release of a chemical called acetylcholine from the end of the nerves. These interact with a receptor on the muscle fiber surface called the acetylcholine receptor and lead to the muscle contracting. The body's immune system can produce autoantibodies which either bind to the receptor directly and so stop the acetylcholine receptor from being activated or to other proteins associated with the acetylcholine receptors such as musk or LRP4 and so lead to its dysfunction. Sometimes this condition can be associated with the tumour of the thymus gland called a thymoma. Sometimes it is because of a generalised overactivation of the immune system and may also involve other autoimmune conditions such as thyroid gland disease and sometimes it can occur in isolation for reasons unknown. These autoantibodies can be detected with a simple blood test but can often take many weeks for the results to come back and sometimes may be negative despite the presence of this condition. There are a variety of other supportive tests which can be relatively simple, more accessible and provide an immediate answer. These could include the ice pack test where placing a cold substance over a weak muscle causes a transient but rapid increase in strength and a tentalon test. This is another alternative where a medication such as edrophonium is administered to the patient. This transiently increases acetylcholine levels and so leads to the transient increase in strength. Of course, there are much more specialised tests utilising clinical neurophysiology's ability to assess neuromuscular junction transmission. Here, specialists such as myself will look for evidence of signal transmission fatigue using a combination of single fibre EMG and repetitive nerve stimulation techniques. You can see a detailed explanation of these particular tests in a separate video by clicking on the iCard above. These are very sensitive and specific investigations which can rapidly answer if the condition is present, but of course do need access to a neurophysiology lab. Myasthenia can occur at any age, but tends to affect younger women and older men. As such, the question of pregnancy is not uncommon and it is still usually safe provided that specialist services are involved both during pregnancy and as for the baby in particular the first weeks after delivery as circulating maternal autoantibodies can affect the newborn until they are naturally depleted. Most myasthenia presents with eye problems such as droopy eyelids or double vision because of weakness of the muscles that move the eyes around. These classically will not be a problem in the morning but worsen as the day progresses. Around 25% of patients will remain with weakness in this region only and this is called ocular myasthenia. However, around three quarters will develop a more widespread form over the next few years which is called generalised myasthenia. Generalised myasthenia may be mild but can be more severe and even life-threatening if the muscles involved with breathing or swallowing are involved. Then hospital admission and inpatient treatment may be required as these can lead to far more serious complications. Treatment is very patient specific and can frustratingly take quite a few months before patients feel benefits from them. There are a number of important management guidelines out there using the best available evidence and consensus where this is limited. These include the ABN, which is the Association of British Neurologists. This was published in 2015 and gives detailed advice for both ocular and generalised myasthenia and the European Federation of Neurological Societies 2014, which concentrates on ocular myasthenia. I append links to these in the text below. I would like to emphasise that specific treatment options and requirements will need discussion between the patient and their healthcare providers. The mainstays of treatment are peridostigmine, which increases acetylcholine levels and when required addition of steroid treatment. This treats the underlying condition by dampening down the immune system. When this is insufficiently effective, contraindicated or the side effects are not tolerated, azathioprine is usually the next recommended step. The ABN guidelines 
highlight that treatment failure with either of these medications may be due to insufficient dosage, and so patients not responding to these should be referred onwards to a specialist in myasthenia. There are other immunosuppression options such as cyclosporine, methotrexate, mycophenolate and rituximab to name a selection, but these are usually reserved for non-responders to steroids and azathioprine and have specific implications regarding pregnancy. Some patients may be very unwell and may need rescue or bridge therapy. There are two main ways in which this can be done either with plasma exchange, where the blood is effectively filtered out and washed clear of these autoantibodies, or patients can be given a blood product called IVIG, which in effect neutralizes the circulating autoantibodies. All patients are recommended to have scans of their thymus glands, looking for underlying thymoma, which occurs in around 10%. Most of these are benign tumors, and where present will generally be recommended to be removed by an experienced surgical and anesthetic team who are used to dealing with myasthenic patients. There is also a role in removing the thymus gland even in patients who do not have a thymoma detected, if they are relatively young, i.e. under the age of 45, have positive acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and the disease has been present for a limited time, usually under two years. There are some very helpful and informative websites where you can find out more information about this condition and interact and be supported with their support groups. These include the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, and you can find their website in the information box below. And for patients in the UK, there is the Myasthenia Gravis Association website called MyAware, which can also be found in the box below. I hope that you have found this video useful, and please support my work with this channel by giving me a thumbs up and subscribing. Thank you very much.